Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ross Johnston, and I am here at Moat Marine Laboratory live down in Sarasota, Florida. Now, today we have a very exciting event for you today. We are celebrating Black History Month here at Moat Marine Lab with a very special presentation called Seeing Yourself in Science, Biologists in Black History. Now, today we are fortunate enough to be joined by not one, not two, but three amazing biologists involved in zoos and aquariums across the United States. Now, these African-American individuals are paving the way and carving their own niche in history as one of amazing individuals making research advancements, conservation advancements, and aquarium biology advancements as well. So I am fortunate enough to, to be joined by Amanda Hodo, who is an aquarium biologist here at Moat Marine Lab. I'm also joined by Jasmine Williams, who is a program coordinator up at the Seattle Aquarium, and Jordan Beasley, who is a zookeeper at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle as well. So I wanna kick it off and start talking a little bit more about who I have with us today. So let's talk a little bit more about your professional goals, what got you into the career that you are. Give us a little bit of background. We'll start with Amanda. Sure. My name is Amanda Hodo. Um, I'm an Aquarium Biologist 3 at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. And I'm from Chicago originally, and I've been working at Moat for just over four years. Wonderful. That's awesome. And what about you, Jordan? So let's tell, hear a little bit more about yourself. I am a zookeeper at Woodland Park Zoo, uh, born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I uh, basically grew up in the zoo and have been a part of the zoo since I was a little kid. And I, I love it there. Wonderful. And what about you, Jasmine? Hello, everyone. I'm here in Seattle, Washington at the Seattle Aquarium, and I am the Community Partner Program Coordinator, um, which means that I manage the connections program that works on accessibility and inclusion and getting communities that don't have the opportunity or chance to uh, come to the aquarium and experience all of we have such a great panel today. I'm very excited to be speaking with all of you. Now, regarding how you got into this field, it's really exciting to be working within a zoo and aquarium. So how did you know you wanted to work in science, first of all, in general, and then let alone streamlined into a zoo and aquarium science conservation education field? So we can start with Amanda. Sure. So actually, when I started out, I didn't really know that I wanted to be in science. I had a lot of interests and a lot of things going on. I was doing a lot of after school activities. So it took, took me a little bit of extra time to kind of narrow it down and, and really kind of run with the realm of marine science. So um, what I ended up doing is doing a lot of programs with the Shedd Aquarium. And I was able to see what it what an aquarium looks like behind the scenes and work with other people in the aquarium. And I really figured out that I wanted to be into, in marine science. So I kind of ran with that. I did more programs in college. And at that point, I didn't know exactly that I wanted to work in an aquarium, but that I wanted to work in marine science. So I did research programs that were also marine science related. And then um, I did an internship with Moat Marine Laboratory, and the rest is history. Awesome. That's great. Now, Jordan, I know that you've been volunteering since you were a little kid, so you started off in the zoo world really young. Let's hear a little bit more about that field. So as a kid growing up, I actually grew up with, uh, you know, anger management problems, and I had some troubles, you know, coping with, with things and, and, and getting into fights and suspensions from school and things like that. And but I always loved animals. I would always go to the zoo with my mom, especially during uh, Mom and Me at the Zoo was one of our events that we had. Um, and we would go to the zoo and she would see how happy I was to be there. And I've I was always happy and chill around animals. So she found a way to kind of, you know, push me into being a volunteer uh, because they didn't really allow 11 year olds to become volunteers, but they kind of made it work for me. And so I was 11 years old working in the family farm at the Park Zoo. And I pretty much stayed there from 11 till about now, <laughs> almost, and I'm, I'm, I'm older. Um, and the zoo, I've always wanted to be working with animals. And uh, one of my big things is I always wanted to educate people about animals. That's one thing I've always loved to do growing up. I love, love, love talking to people about the animals I work with and other animals in general. That's one of my uh, favorite things to do. 
oh, that's so inspirational. That's awesome that you're already have such a long tenure there. Now, Jordan, uh, Jasmine, so you're not an aquarium biologist. Uh, you are not a zookeeper. You're in education and program outreach. How did you get interested in that field? Yeah, that was a, a winding path, I will say. Um, growing up, I didn't necessarily want to work at an aquarium or a zoo. Um, I did volunteer at the Seattle Aquarium in high school, um, and that was my kind of big introduction into marine science. Um, and that's when I discovered that I loved it, and I loved science, I loved marine science, I loved the environment, um, but I wasn't sure that I wanted to be uh, like a research biologist. And so when we hear about biology and sciences, um, one of the things that we all kind of tend to go straight towards is research biology. And I knew that's not what I wanted to do, but I didn't know what the other options were. Um, and so it took me down this kind of winding path. When I went to school, I majored in environmental studies in the hopes that that would give me some options. Um, and then I landed in this position at the aquarium with education, um, sort of on purpose, but also on accident, a little bit opportunist. Um, and reading the job description, I got really excited about it because it was um, that education of talking to people and being connected to people, but also still being a part of marine science, so being, being a part of um, the field that I loved and wanted to be involved in. Um, and so it definitely was a winding road. Um, and I, the position that I'm in is brand new. So they've never had a position like this at the aquarium. So even when I was in school, I wouldn't have aspired to be what I am right now because it didn't exist. Um, and so really I just kind of followed the different areas of my passions and then uh, kind of melded this position um, and helped create it um, in this new kind of venture that the aquarium and zoos generally are going in. Um, they're doing more um, outreach uh, to communities that don't usually have opportunities. And so, um, yeah, it was a little bit of a, of a winding path and didn't quite exist when I was growing up. So um, a bit on the forefront, I think. Well, congratulations. That is very exciting. That you are paving the way with a brand new position. So our next question kind of goes, is a really good transition for that. What are some career ex uh, highlights that you've had so far? So, I mean, let's start with jo uh, Jasmine, considering that you actually have a brand new role to fill. So obviously that's a career highlight, but what about in particular? Um, you know, the thing that I really love about my job is that it really does blend all of my passions together. So I love marine science. I love the animals, I love the environment, I love people, and I really love giving back. Um, and growing up in a community that didn't have opportunities and experiences, I felt very compelled to want to give back and have service towards the communities that I grew up in. And so um, growing up, you know, and in college, it kind of, it feels like you have to pick one straight path. Like I have to go down this road or this road or this road in the position that I'm in, I'm able to, combine them all. So I get to go into a elementary school or a community center and I teach a class. Um, and then I talk about the marine science and I talk about the animals um, and I get the kids all excited. And then I come back and then I'm able to be in the aquarium and I can see the animals. And so it really just combines all the things that I like into one position. Um, and it's always changing. Sometimes I'm on the beach and I get to do low tide beach walks, sometimes on the river and I'm talking about salmon. And then sometimes I'm in the office uh, typing on a computer. Um, but the highlight is really that variety. I love being able to do so many different things. That's awesome. Quite the professional multitasker. I love that. Now, <laughs> well, about Jordan. Uh, so obviously you've been there for ages and you've seen lots of changes. I'm sure you have resumes full of highlights, but what's the best thing about working at that zoo? Uh, one of my favorite things about working at the zoo is is getting to interact with the public, especially when I do, because I work with uh, hippos right now. Um, one of my favorite things to do is is when I go over and, and feed the hippos from the public viewing area, I'll toss in food to the hippos like, you know, you know apples, watermelons, whatever, the different vegetables and things. Um, and I love the questions that I get and I get to just interact. I, I love, that's my favorite part about my job is interacting with people because there's questions 
And is there this thing that I, I can't, I can't let people go on, like move on away from the exhibit with the question gone unanswered. Like I'll hear questions and I can't, I can't, I can't just like sit by and like hear incorrect, you know, information. I have to like let them know what's going on with that uh, animal. Um, that's one of my favorite things. And, and just, um, I like seeing uh, different uh, kids' faces light up when they see me uh, being a person of, of color, you know, working with these animals and, and they can think, oh, hey, maybe I can do something similar. If he's able to do it, I think we can all do this. And so it, I feel like uh, just working with animals in general uh, just breaks different, you know, stereotypes and things that there might be out there about, um, about animals and people. Um, and also, actually, I get to do um, one of my newer highlights is I just got approved to do a uh, mini video series uh, with the zoo about um, misunderstood or, or, you know, animals that, that go, you know, overlooked, that get overlooked at the zoo. That's going to be as a fun little little sneak peek into something. I can't really talk too much about that. <laughs> so, but no, I, I really love uh, talking with people. I, I'm one of, I feel like I'm one of the zookeepers um, that will actually go out, you know, walk around the zoo and, and look for people and, and hear questions. And, and I want to talk. That's, That's kind awesome. of one of my main things. So you're paid to make people's day. That's pretty great. <laughs> sure. <laughs> awesome. Now, Amanda, besides working with me, obviously, as <laughs> what else is a highlight of you being here at Moat? So something that I've kind of realized in the last couple of years is that I really, really love working with babies and larval fish and reproduction. And that is definitely have, has been a huge highlight for me um, in these later years is that I get to breed various kinds of fish and then it also has a it's part of a larger conservation impact so being a part of that has been definitely a big highlight for me um and i would also say getting opportunities to work with you guys in education uh whether it's talking to kids and showing them the lab showing them what i'm up to um and seeing their little faces light up that's been really amazing and i feel really fortunate that my uh, co-workers and my supervisors have been really supportive of me um, working, doing that as well. So um, yeah, that, those are some, those are two really big highlights for me. That's awesome. And that's a great transition into overall conservation. So as Moat Marine Lab and the Woodland Park Zoo and the Seattle Aquarium, we're all members of AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Now we are fortunate enough to have some AZA Hero Award participants. So, which is very exciting. Can you tell us a little bit more about what is AZA? What are we striving for working within zoos and aquariums? And what is this award about? Uh, so let's start with Amanda. Sure. So for me, AZA means it's the Association for Zoos and Aquariums. I'll just start by saying that. And um, it is a collection of zoos and aquariums that have gone through really difficult inspections. Um, there's a large criteria that has, has to be met um, in these inspections. And uh, they once they pass the inspection, then uh, they just, sorry, it's a little hard to, <laughs> but it's, they, they res, you know, they're, they're part of this, this um, larger group of zoos and aquariums that meet these regulations and meet these goals, whether it be, um, animal husbandry, yes. education, yep. conservation. That's wonderful that it's so multifaceted that you're raising mm -hmm. animal animals. welfare. Yeah. Um, really, really important uh, criteria. And then awesome. uh, within, within these zoos and aquariums, uh, you have, you know, we all belong mm -hmm. to these institutions and there's so many different roles in these. And what is the role of an AZA hero? What, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, this was a contest that they put on uh, in 2018 for the first time, and they were taking video submissions, and they wanted to hear from anyone and everyone. So at, you know, whether you were a CEO or whether you were an aquarist, whether you were a zookeeper, uh, whether you worked in records, you know, they wanted videos from everyone, and they wanted you to talk about why you care, why awesome. you love your jobs. Um, and what is your story? Yeah, and Absolutely. what is your story, and and what makes your job so special? So, so all three of you participated in this. So Jordan, tell me a little bit more. What does 
being an AZA hero participant mean to you? Why did you apply? What, what's the, what's the story you wanted to share? Well, for me, I uh, actually was approached by, <laughs> by the zoo, um, ha- wanting, you know, wanting me to, to spread my story because they, they love the fact that I've been at the zoo for so long. And basically, I think my story was the fact that I, to, I wanted to share what Woodland Park meant to me uh, as a zoo and then the fact that we are an AZA facility and the fact that we held, are held to higher standards and we, you know, have to, we set an example for others to, we basically are leading in this field of conservation. Um, and what made me want to participate uh, was that I just, I just want to help, you know, get the image out there of people of color, because, you know, for me, there wasn't, I didn't really have many people to look up to as far as a, a people of color in the zookeeping field. I, you know, to walking around, I don't see very many African American zookeepers, um, at least not where I grew up. Um, and so that was something that I wanted to change and help give an image for for students and, and other just, just people out there um, for as far as conservation goes. Oh, um, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear. And what about you, Jasmine? What does being an AZA hero participant and being involved in this giant conservation and education based community mean to you? Well, I I feel like it's uh, opportunities for like-minded people to come together uh, and hold each other accountable, uh, which I think is really great. It, uh, AZA sets a, essentially sets a standard of excellence, right? And everyone um, who's a part of AZA is held to that standard. And so we collectively are all challenging um, and pushing ourselves to be more and to be better. Um, and like Jordan, I was also approached <laughs> by the aquarium um, because I shared my story um, at a couple of events at the aquarium and um, starting out as a high school volunteer and the story of coming back um, and the work that I do, I'm so passionate about it because um, I didn't, like Jordan, didn't see any faces that looked like mine when I was coming up. Um, and so the work that I do is really fueled by wanting to share with others that they're not alone, right? Like when you're, so honestly speaking, the zoo and aquarium field is very white. Um, and so there are not a lot of people of color. And so um, it's easy to feel isolated or feel like you're the only person. Um, and so when Jordan and Amanda and us share our stories, it just validates other people who want to come up in this field to know that they're not alone. And so I think that's what was so amazing and beautiful about the AZA uh, Heroes Contest. It was an opportunity for people to hear these stories that don't typically get heard. Um, and the stories of people who, um, you know, are not the faces that resemble the majority. Um, and so I think that was the, the real beauty um, of the contest. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we are lucky enough to actually have copies of your videos that you were able to submit. So we are going to queue up those videos to play for you folks so you can see a little bit more about what it's like with these individuals in their daily work environment. Because working in a zoo and an aquarium, there is no average day. So let's take a look at what it is, what it means to be an AZA hero on a daily basis. And we'll also be able to, and I also see that we have a lot of chats and questions coming in, which is great. We're going to save the questions for the end. It is going to be an open discussion live forum. So thank you so much for continuing to type in these questions. I promise we will get to them absolutely. And potentially your questions might be answered um, just through content that is provided. Hi, my name is Amanda Hodo, and I'm an Aquarium Biologist 1 at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. I was born and raised in blustery, chilly Chicago, I went to college in the cornfields of Grinnell, Iowa, and now I live in sunny, beautiful Sarasota. Come with me and I'll show you what I do. So how am I a hero? I'm a hero for conservation. I breed fish to lessen the impacts of aquariums on our oceans and to help our industry be more sustainable. As an aquarist working with the Lion Seahorse's Species Survival Plan, I breed new genetic lines and share those offspring with other AZA accredited facilities. I also spent about two years breeding neon gobies, which we released into many of our exhibits to improve the overall health of our fish and systems. There are over 250 in our shark exhibit alone. 
I love to look for them while I work and often find them cleaning our groupers. I'm also a hero for diversity. When I was a teen, I never saw a Clarice that looked like me. My goal is to help inspire a love of the ocean and science into kids in underserved communities. Because if you see it, then you feel more like you can achieve it. So for me, visibility is key. I've been featured on Moat's podcast to see fans talking about Signapids, have done a live stream with SeaTrack TV during Black History Month about African Americans in marine science, and currently serve as a mentor of Moat's Sci Girls program, which aims to help young girls explore STEM career opportunities. I love getting young people excited about science, which aligns with Moat's mission. What else do I love to do at work? Scavenge donuts. What? Seahorses need to eat constantly and so do I. Eat cheese. Socialize. Well, I am an eye on the disc profile after all. Thanks for watching. Jacques Custodo out. What does it mean to just be a black biologist in general? I mean, I would say it's it's a different experience. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I'm a biologist. Yes, we're all three of us are biologists. Um, but our day to day isn't necessarily exactly the same as you know our coworkers. So um, I firmly firmly agree with what Jasmine was saying earlier about like sometimes you can feel a little alone. Um, so this contest was awesome because I got to meet the two of them um, and just meeting and meeting them I automatically felt a little bit of validation and we had some amazing conversations right off the bat and immediately felt a little less alone you know what I mean so um, it, it can be hard um, to be able to feel that way but um wonderful getting better so and what about uh jordan how do you feel coming so i know that you spoke about representation about it's great to see a face like mine have you ever had any personal connections or stories or what are some of the people what, what are people saying to you on a daily basis out in the park um well i do i do get a lot of people uh that have seen some uh some of the videos that i've that i've done with uh with the zoo and and some videos that i've done on my own um, and, and people say, oh, like they, they, they love, they love what I do. And I get a lot of uh, people on Facebook and things that try to connect with me and, and, and have me be their guide around their, around the zoo, like to their families and stuff, like people that I grew up with, they want me to basically show their kids, you know, a, a really fun time at the zoo because their kids love animals. And I, for me, it's like, I've become, I feel like I'm slowly becoming a, 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 a role model for for a lot of uh, kids of color, and it's it means a lot to me. Like to 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 see to see that kids are looking up to me, which is I never really thought that would would happen. Um, but I don't know I, I'm I'm using my voice for something positive, but it makes me happy to do. That. Oh, very well said. And uh, what about you, Jasmine? Do you have any connections or stories? Has anything jumped out to you in particular? How have you been a role model? especially within your field, uh, concerning you do outreach and program coordination. Right, so I think um, there are a lot of, lot of different things and aspects of my job um, where I'm, I'm kind of required to be a, an outwardly facing um, representation of the aquarium. Um, and I think that in itself has brought a lot of um, attention, um, but also just, um, opportunities for younger folks to, to see and experience uh, a different face for conservation. Um, and I think um, being in this field um, as an African-American, I feel a very strong sense of responsibility. Um, and I think that is a little bit different than other people might feel, um, that I am advocating and standing up for uh, groups of people. Um, who have not necessarily been seen um, and creating pathways uh, for them to join the field and begin to change what things look like. Um, Great so, answer. Yeah. 
Oh, that was great. Wonder wonderfully well said. Now, considering that all of you are role models, which is very inspirational and just wonderful to hear that you're making connections on a daily basis, do you have any role models that jump out at you as an African-American in science or just in history in general who has really inspired you to get to where you currently are? We'll start with Amanda. Sure. Uh, for me, uh, right off the bat, I think of Roger R. Leonard Young. Um, she was the first African-American woman to earn a doctorate in zoology. And um, I think of other names, you know, Dr. Ashanti Johnson and uh, Dr. Dehana Figueroa. And to bring it back to, um, I actually, I very much looked up to Jordan and Jasmine, to be quite honest. And I was really, really fortunate that I got to meet them both the way that I did. Um, I knew of Jordan because I actually saw one of the videos that he was mentioning earlier, um, which was all about being a black zookeeper. And I watched it. I was actually forwarded that video by one of my coworkers because it was very, very similar to what the experience that I had been sharing with him. And um, he said, you have to see this video. And I was like, man, this Jordan guy is awesome. It would be <laughs> awesome to beat him. And then how did I meet him? I met him while he was feeding the hippos <laughs> at Woodland Park Zoo. So it was pretty, pretty incredible. And then um, later on, I met Jasmine as well. She walked down the stairs. We locked eyes. I was like, I have to talk to her. So um, it's been incredible, you know, working, working with both of you. And um, you guys inspire me every day. Oh, my gosh. That's so great. So even though they're 3,000 miles away, it's still such a small world. So before I jump over to Jordan and Jasmine, um, that was a perfect segue for Jordan's video. So we're going to get right back to talking with both of you, and let's play Jordan's video in the meantime. As a kid, Willem Park Zoo was my second home. I was here so much, it was like having animals next door. I mean, what kid wouldn't want a hippo in their backyard? I grew up with severe anger management issues, um, but when I was at the zoo, my anger always seemed to fade away. Realizing this was my happy place, my mom enrolled me in the volunteer program when I was 11, making history as one of the youngest volunteers ever. I found an extended family at the zoo. Uh, I bonded with animals, staff, and other volunteers, which is why I never left. When I was younger, I never realized I was the only child of color in my program. I just knew that I loved animals. Today, as a black zookeeper, I feel as though it provides me the unique opportunity to inspire children of color who come to the zoo. It inspires me, like it really inspires me to see these kids come into the zoo because they their, their eyes light up and, and, and shine and they get really excited to think that they can do something what, like what I'm doing. Imagine what it feels like for a kid to come to the zoo and see someone working with the animals who looks like them. I'm so grateful to be able to do this here at Willow Park Zoo, my favorite place to be and my second home. Oh, man, I don't know if there's a dry eye in the house right now. <laughs> so, Jordan, let's talk a little bit more about heroes that got you to where you are. Um, is there anyone in African-American history or currently that really have just inspired and empowered you? Well, there is one particular person that has always inspired me. I even wrote a, a couple different essays about him when I was a kid. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is my all-time uh, African-American hero from history just because he was a spokesperson for for us and 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 just getting equality for african americans and just people of color in general and um i kind of want to be the spokesperson for animals and in the wildlife and the connection that people have with animals i want to help get more people of color and just people in general more people involved with animals and animal care and because we need to protect these animals um because we're kind of killing the world, and that's not really, not really cool. Um, but yeah, def definitely Dr. King was a uh, definitely an inspiration for me growing up. Oh, wonderful! Oh, that's so great to hear. Now, before we play Jasmine's video, let's talk a little bit more about who really empowered and motivated Jasmine to not only care about environmental education, but to proactively reach out to the community. So, Jasmine, who got you to where you currently are? You know. That saying that says uh, it takes a village to raise a child, uh, that really rings true for me. Um, so when I think about African Americans in science, African Americans in marine science, um, you know, 
unfortunately, no one pops in my head. Um, and I think that is just part of the issue. Um, and something that I realized when I was older is that I never learned about these people um, until I actively had to reach out and find them um, or like do my own digging because I can't learn about them in school. And so the people that were really the most influential were the ones that were with me on a daily basis. Um, so like I had a marine science teacher um, who was incredible in supporting me and um, helping helping pave the way, my mom, right, like coaches, these people in sort of these school and out of school settings are really the ones that encouraged me to um, pursue my passions and careers and um, kind of went that extra mile of uh, giving support, even if they didn't exactly know how to give support in marine science or in what I was interested in, they were very interested in supporting me as a person and as a human. Um, and I think that's really, um, what compelled me and um, helped support me. Oh, fantastic answer. That's wonderful that it took a village to raise you, and now you are giving back to that village, which is so great. So now let's jump over to your video, Jasmine, and let's see what you're doing to help out that village that helped raise you. My name is Jasmine, and I am excited to be participating in AZA Heroes. And I'm here at the Seattle Aquarium, um, where I first started as a high school volunteer. And that, in combination with my uh, local high school's marine science program, uh, I really developed a desire to want to be in the ocean conservation field problem was that I didn't quite uh, see myself being a marine biologist, but ultimately because I really didn't feel like I fit in. Um, growing up in Seattle as a black female in marine science, I was kind of an oddball. And so because of these experiences and attitudes that I had towards what I thought a scientist looks like or what I thought a scientist is, uh, I chose not to go into marine biology and ultimately decided to pursue a career in environmental education. And it allowed me to um, work with community, um, but also get to share my love for the ocean. Uh, and so here at the Seattle Aquarium, um, I'm able to do that as a part of the Connections Program. And the Connections Program uh, is striving to make the aquarium a more accessible and inclusive place um, to all surrounding communities. And these are specifically targeting communities that have been historically oppressed and often marginalized. Through my role as the Community Partner Program Coordinator, uh, I get to go into the communities and be the face that I never saw and then begin to change the perception of what marine science is and looks like. I'm so deeply passionate about this work because it's important. It's important to me. It's important to our future and the future of the next generation. If we really want to make a significant impact on our environment, then we're going to need to create a culture that is welcoming and inclusive of everyone. And we must begin to change the faces of wildlife conservation so that children like my own daughter feel represented, so that they feel heard, and so that they can see themselves being able to make a difference and we all can be AZA heroes. That is so wonderful that all three of you are literally shaping the future into being a more inclusive and opening and welcoming environment. But it wasn't always this way. So unfortunately, I'm sure all of you have had a lot of struggles and challenges. So let's go around and what was a challenge or a problem that you faced either on your career path, but made, maybe made you question if this was the right field for you? How did you overcome that struggle? What advice would you give to aspiring biologists that are maybe facing similar problems? So we'll start with Amanda. Sure. Um, so for me, I would say uh, Jasmine touched on this briefly too. Um, so she talked about how sometimes she feels a responsibility to you know, be that face and to connect and do outreach with you know the communities that need to see it the most and um i would say that that has rang true for me i i also feel that obligation a lot and i'd say a challenge is, is sometimes i can feel a little bit overwhelmed on occasion sometimes um i get into situations where i start to doubt myself and doubt whether i you know can take on so much responsibility can i be that face, you know, sometimes I can feel a little overwhelming and I can start to doubt myself. So I think in the 
more recent time, I think I'm starting to come into that role more and feel more comfortable in that role. But sometimes day to day, that can be that can be a lot of pressure and a lot of, you know, can be a challenge. So based on all that pressure and responsibility, if you if there's students out there that want to do biology or marine science, what advice would you give them if they're feeling that that mm -hmm. pressure and responsibility? Um, just know that, uh, you know, people have your back and that people are supporting you. People, you are just by being there, you are probably, you know, you're probably changing someone's perception or, you know, lifting someone up by being there. The fact that a child may not have seen a black biologist before, they've never seen someone that looks like you be interested in that just by being there, you can possibly be helping someone. But I would say also for advice, um, if you can find, you know, a group of a support group, whether it be teachers, for me, um, a lot of it was teachers, um, stick with that support group and um, constantly work on, work on yourself and well said. Um, taking, taking opportunities, that is really huge. Um, sometimes I felt like I was underqualified for something or it was going to be too scary to take a really big risk. Um, but as my mom always says, um, you got to risk it for the biscuit. So, <laughs> so sometimes you have to take that, you have to take that leap and oh. you never know. Wonderful. Work out. Well, that's so. a great transition to talking to Jasmine about the same question that this really empowered Amanda because there were people around her to be there to support her. So Jasmine is one of those entities where she is there to provide that support. So Jasmine, mm -hmm. what were some challenges and struggles that you might have had regarding this career path or growing up um, as an African-American biologist? And how, what advice would you give? Yeah, I would say um, one of the, I think, hindrances of people entering this field um, is there is this dilemma um, when you're going through college and deciding what you want to do and uh, when you're thinking about money and finances and um, sometimes choosing to follow your passion and what you love means that you might have to sacrifice um, some money, right? Or, or sacrifice this high paying job. Zoos and aquariums um, typically are city run or they're nonprofits and we're not known necessarily for like making a whole bunch of money. Um, and so sometimes I think um, in order to get into this field, it, re it generally requires you to do some sort of like unpaid volunteer um, opportunity experience. Um, and that's not always an option for people. Um, and I think that's part of um, some of the things that need to be changed in the industry um, because that can stop people from participating. Um, and me, myself, um, coming into the field, um, you know, it was a struggle <laughs> from the beginning um, financially, just trying to figure out if I'm taking this unpaid internship or if I'm giving this volunteer experience, um, then how do I support myself? How do I support my family? Um, and I think you have to get a bit creative on how to do that. Um, and um, it helps when you have family around. Um, I was born and raised in Seattle, so I have family around, and that's really helpful. Um, but I do think um, that uh, that can be a, a challenge for entering the field and something that people should just be aware of um, because uh, that's always uh, – something to be thinking about because you do need internships or volunteer. I mean, all, all three of us did some sort of internship volunteer opportunity before we were even able to get a, a paid position. Luckily, there's actually a lot of free money out there in scholarships and grants, which is actually a great transition because we actually have some slides on some of the available scholarships. In particular, there's actually a scholarship for African-Americans students interested in marine science. Let's jump over to Jordan. So Jordan, what were some of the challenges that you faced? The, what were some of the struggles that you might have um, encountered and how did you overcome them and what advice would you give? Actually, the reason why I made that video that Amanda was mentioning was because of, uh, because of something that was the final straw for me. I was, I was just about done with I hear a lot of comments, uh, you know, going through the zoo sometimes and at other facilities I've worked at. I've gone through a lot of comments and heard negative tones 
about basically people undermining me in my position at the zoo because it's very uncommon common for people to see African Americans as zookeepers and they kind of try to demean us and, and see us as something lower than what we are, um, not smart and things like that. And uh, you know, I, I I was I was just about tired of of hearing all these negative comments, and so I made that video um, talking about why we matter and why I'm in that you know why I'm in the world I'm in. Um, I wanted to break stereotypes, and um, you know, growing up too, like uh, Jasmine mentioned, growing up too, it was it was you know, the struggle. People would always ask me, oh you won't make very much money doing that job or don't, are you sure you're going to be able to, you know, get money doing that? And, you know, and, and like, it's, it's, oh, the, the whole stereotype about how animals are, are dangerous and, you know, our kind don't really work with animals, that whole thing growing up. And I basically was like, well, I love animals and I'm here for the animals and I'm here for conservation. And I don't really care about what people think. And that was the thing about me growing up and, and how I've, somewhat feel like I've evolved with myself. I focus on myself and educating people. And I didn't, you know, I didn't follow up. Oh, you know, you should be a, you know, no offense to people that are, that are, uh, you know, lawyers or something, but you know, you should have been a lawyer and it's like that. You're so smart. Why did you want to work with animals and smart? I have not met a, a dumb zookeeper, <laughs> not one. There are these, like everyone in animal care and animal sciences are so intelligent. It's, like, you know, everybody up here, they're, they're really intelligent. And um, that's just one thing that I've had to kind of go through with in, in my career so far. Something that I'm trying to break, these stereotypes. Well said. That's wonderful. And that actually is a really great transition because, unfortunately, I am aware of the time and we are tragically running out of time. Uh, so before we move on, I do want to highlight what is on your screen right now. So there is a Marine Conservation Diversity Fellowship. So there's a lot of available money out there if you are an underrepresented individual looking for a career in a field where you might not see yourself. So make sure you scour Google and find all these opportunities because if you have a passion, you should absolutely follow it. Now, moving on, because unfortunately we only have about five minutes left, one of the questions that was brought up in the chat, which I thought was wonderful and a great closing comment, would be, if you, what is one piece of advice that you could that you would give to someone that is African American or just an underrepresented individual that's interested in going into marine science, into the field of aquariums or zoos in general? And how do you inspire the next generation? Obviously, we're super inspired right now. But what advice would these teachers bring back to their classrooms? I'm oh, sorry, okay. Amanda. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, for me, I would I would say you know. Try to, if you have a lot of interest, try to narrow them down if possible. And then once you really find your niche, you know, tell everybody about it. I mean, I think that when I, some of my favorite moments are having people come to the conservation lab. And when I was breeding seahorses, I would love to show them what I was doing. And someone once told me, like, it's very clear how passionate you are when you talk about it. So, for me, I've been able to utilize that, whether I'm talking to groups of kids or groups, groups of adults, um, figure out what you love and then figure out what's best for you and how to communicate that love. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's advice well, that's, for me. Yeah. Find out what you love and how do you get there? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Figure out your goals and figure out, you know, a path and what you need to do to get there. Oh, fantastic. Now, uh, Jasmine, what about you? Um, what in, how would you empower and inspire the next generation if they're having doubts? Yeah, I would say um, for teachers um, to... Hi! Hello! <laughs> we have some enthusiastic yeah. individuals. Uh, go ahead, keep going. Would continue um, to just give students exposure. So, you know, when I was younger, um, you know, part of why I didn't know what I wanted to do because I, I didn't see anything like it. I didn't see these experiences. I didn't have these experiences. And I would say for uh, educators 
and teachers to just expose students to a variety of options and allow them to choose the things that are interesting to them. And then when you are exposing them to these variety of options, um, instead of highlighting the typical people that we see, highlight some people of color. Um, and let that be the exposure. Whether you have students of color or not, um, non-students of color also need to see that there are other people in these fields. So when you, um, you know, highlight a scientist in your class during your science theme, um, make the, one of those scientists is uh, a person of color, right? Um, and just expose them to a variety of experiences. And then when, um, you know, when they get excited about something, encourage them and support them and, um, you know, help them maybe find some resources because um, their families at home may or may not be able to help and support them in that way. Um, and so I would say, you know, my mom was amazing and helped support me, but uh, part of the reason that I got to where I am was really because of that community and the other people surrounding me also helping me. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be really great. Great answer. Absolutely. And what about you, Jordan? Same question. Well, any advice that I will give, uh, I would basically say uh, stay true to yourself. Um, if you have any passions, just go ahead and go for it. Um, just just follow your dreams uh, as long as, you know, you, you have a way to support yourself as long as you're not, you know. I mean, I'm personally going to the broke house right now myself. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine. Um, I uh, just I just want to say, for, like, for at least for, for stuff that I do, I all this stuff, like all my videos and things that I do, that is on my own time. Um, I'm not making any money for it or anything like that. I just do it because I have a passion to educate people. And I, I, I wanna use my platform to, to get more people like us involved. Um, and as far as that, you know, like you don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be, you know, what I, I swear I have nothing against lawyers. I keep saying lawyer, but it's what's in my head right now but you don't have to do what society is telling you to do. You can do whatever you want. Great answer. And that's actually a really great transition. So speaking of platforms in general, along with the registration link for this program, you also got a link for a Flipgrid. Now a Flipgrid is a really awesome way of staying in touch with these three individuals. It is a question and answer program where you'll be able to record videos um, as well as type in questions. So even though unfortunately this, pro this program, this presentation, is winding down, that doesn't mean that we're going to be out of contact. So after this presentation, if you have any questions, I know we sent out some worksheets for all you students out there. If you have any questions regarding careers and future uh, developments and interests, post them up on our Flipgrid, and all four of us will be able to respond, which is very exciting. So just because we're out of sight does not mean we are out of mind. Now, we unfortunately are winding down on the time. We have hit our 50 minutes. But if you enjoyed this presentation, we have two more live streams for you that are coming up. The next one is on February 28th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. So if you are fans of sharks and conservation research, we'll be joining Dr. Bob Huter out on the O-Search research vessel. Now, this is footage from previous O-Search expeditions. So Dr. Bob Huter is a senior scientist here at MOAT within our shark conservation and research program. So he'll be connecting with us live out on this vessel as they leave Florida and gradually make their way up to the northeast coast of Canada, tagging great white sharks. So if you are interested, make sure you tune in on February 28th. Additionally, we also have a program on March 4th regarding internships here at Moat Marine Laboratory. For all you students out there, if you want to learn about what it takes to be an intern and get into the field of volunteering in marine labs and aquariums, just like the individuals that you spoke with today did, then make sure, make sure you check out that live stream out on the fourth. So I want to personally say thank you so much for joining us. So this was wonderful. I learned so much. Boy, am I inspired. Oof, it's amazing. So any final closing statements, Amanda? Uh, sure. So if you're feeling like you want to go for something and you're not entirely sure if, you know, you're feeling like maybe it's a little too big of a dream, just remember that you can't win it if you ain't in it. So <laughs> don't be afraid to go for those goals and um, put your best foot forward. Awesome. And what about you, Jordan? Any final closing statements? Um, 
it's not really a closing statement. I did want to say if you guys do want to contact me uh, separately, you can go to my social media. Um, it's uh, Jungle Jordan on all social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. I do a lot of fun videos. You can watch those over there if you want. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said uh, earlier, you know, follow your dreams. Awesome, wonderful. And Jasmine, any closing statements? Just thank you so much for watching. Um, I do hope that this was um, informative and educational. And um, if there are some budding biologists and uh, future aquarium and zoo uh, industry folks, um, I'm really excited to see what you do in the future. Oh, wonderful. We are all very excited. So make sure that you follow us up on that Flipgrid. Post your questions, comments. I know we didn't get to a lot of the comments, but it's the nature of these programs. We just had too much fun talking. So uh, stay in touch with us on our Flipgrid. And once again, thank you so much for joining us here today. Once again, my name is Ross. I'm with Amanda, Jordan, and Jasmine. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us here at Trek TV.